In this episode of the 10K Podcast, I'm going to go through the 1968 annual report for Teledyne. In the previous episode, I went through the early history of Teledyne and discussed the origin of the company. In this episode, I'm going to talk about the second stage of Teledyne, which involved getting into the insurance business. In the book, Distant Force, the author mentions that, quote, Henry Singleton had three great ideas in creating and growing Teledyne. His first was to recognize the importance of digital semiconductor electronics when this technology was in its infancy and by selective acquisitions create a strong base in this growing field on which to diversify his company. The second was to acquire and organize a selection of financial companies within his company to provide the strong financial base I've described above, which also allowed the rest of the financial world to recognize Teledyne as an important entity and potential client, end quote. In the last episode, I covered how Teledyne got its start in digital semiconductor electronics and how it grew through acquisitions. The second stage, where Teledyne acquired financial companies, really got kicked off in 1968. Before I talk about insurance, though, I want to highlight a few interesting points Singleton made in the annual report. He highlighted the focus on sustained growth, as he clearly cared about durability over the long term, as opposed to short-term gains that could fade. Singleton wrote, quote, Teledyne has been systematically organized around a plan designed to produce sustained growth, and its assets are continuously deployed and redeployed with the goal of growth in mind. Experience shows that new emerging industries offer the most favorable opportunities for maximum business growth, end quote. Growth was clearly important to Singleton and to Teledyne. The company was earning nice profits and reinvesting those profits back into the business. Teledyne kept compounding its capital over the years. At the same time, its capital also kept growing due to mergers and acquisitions. Even though this can be a good problem to have, eventually it can be difficult to continue finding investment opportunities as a firm gets larger and larger. This is where insurance came into play, as financial companies can potentially absorb large amounts of capital over time. I'll get back to this topic in a minute. Singleton went on to talk about the benefits of the conglomerate or holding company structure. Writing, quote, At Teledyne, these newer industries are usually based on advances in technology, and in their early stages of rapid growth, they may involve substantial risk and often require the infusion of large amounts of capital. But Teledyne is organized as a family of businesses. In Teledyne, certain new and rapidly expanding businesses, which are essential to future growth, are associated with a number of more established and stable businesses. The latter, while growing at a slower rate, throw off the capital that is required to sustain the expanding activities. This combination in a single corporation of a group of new and rapidly growing businesses with a group of more mature and stable businesses is at the heart of Teledyne's strategy for growth. Teledyne's current annual rate of cash flow amounts to some $60 million and that money is being reinvested in areas of our business that we consider most productive. Not included in cash flow are many additional millions invested each year in research and development. Such research and development expenditures never appear as earnings and accordingly free of taxes. This is because the mature businesses which generate the money to support such expenditures are in the same corporation as the newer businesses which absorb the money. These considerations illustrate the economic superiority of Teledyne's form of corporate organization to older and narrower structures. If effectively employed, our organizational form and method must surely contribute a substantial measure of support to our long-term objective of sound and steady growth, end quote. Capital can more easily flow from one business to another inside of a conglomerate or holding company. Teledyne had a mix of young and old businesses, those that were mature 
and those that were maybe a little less stable. The mature businesses produced cash, and the newer businesses needed to consume cash. Mature businesses often lack high-quality reinvestment opportunities, but Teledyne's structure solved this problem without having to pay dividends to shareholders that would end up being taxed. The newer, more immature businesses needed to raise capital, and Teledyne's structure solved this problem as well. These businesses could raise capital without having to go to a bank, talk to venture capital firms, which didn't really exist too much back in this time, or without having to go through the IPO process. The parent company could fund a subsidiary's need for capital at this time. This structure was also tax efficient. I already mentioned that Teledyne's structure reduced the need for taxable dividends to be paid out to shareholders. In addition, part of the spending for growth was related to research and development. This was an expense that hit the income statement and therefore reduced both reported net income as well as income taxes. Mature businesses with plenty of taxable income might need less R&D spending, while other subsidiaries might not report any taxable income yet, but might have large R&D needs. Within Teledyne, these two situations could even themselves out a bit. At the end of the day, any investment in R&D eventually needs to earn an adequate return on investment. This means that there needs to be taxable income eventually. Losing money forever just to shield taxes is not a smart strategy. Teledyne appeared to be making wise investments at this point in time, and the holding company structure just allowed it to do so efficiently. Now, back to the big change that Teledyne experienced in 1968. This was related to their entrance into the insurance field. In the annual report for that year, Singleton wrote, quote, During 1968, a step of relatively minor immediate significance, but of major importance for our future long-term growth, was Teledyne's acquisition of 52% of the stock of Unicoa Corporation. Unicoa through its wholly owned subsidiary, United Insurance Company of America, will assist in providing the greatly enlarged financial base that will be essential a few years in the future for maintenance at that time of our established pattern of growth, end quote. Teledyne bought 52% of Unicoa in 1968, but eventually increased its stake to over 90% ownership in the company over the next handful of years. Unicoa was based in Chicago, and was involved in the life insurance business. Teledyne went on to make more and more acquisitions in this field, which was just in their nature. Almost all the acquisitions of financial companies were focused on the insurance business. Teledyne did acquire a savings and loan company, though. This company was called Fireside Thrift and was based out of California. Singleton continued with his acquisition spree in financial companies, buying Argonaut Insurance, which specialized in workers' compensation. Later, a Dallas property and casualty company called Trinity Universal Insurance Company was added, and this was folded into Unicoa. They acquired several companies in the automobile insurance business and the auto refinancing business. Teledyne added the Great Central Insurance Company which was a commercial, multi peril insurer for small retail businesses and also operated in the workers' compensation field. Next, the company entered the reinsurance field through its acquisition of Guarantee Reinsurance. Both the Great Central Insurance Company and Guarantee Reinsurance merged into Argonaut. Financial Indemnity, a Los Angeles-based firm mostly in auto insurance, was their final acquisition in the financial space, and this one was merged inside of Unicoa. In the end, all of these financial companies they acquired were put inside either Unicoa, later called Unitrin, or Argonaut. Argonaut and Unitrin were eventually spun out as separate entities outside of Teledyne. Argonaut was spun out to shareholders in 1986, while Unitrin was spun out as a separate company in 1990. As you can see, Teledyne made quite a few acquisitions within the insurance industry. These acquisitions took place in just a short period of only a few years. 
It all started in 1968, the year that this annual report covers. The initial questions that pop up for me are, why did a group of scientists and engineers enter the insurance business? Why did Teledyne own the insurance companies within their conglomerate that started out completely non-financial? The author writes about this in the book Distant Force, and Singleton talked about this in a few different interviews. In Distant Force, the author says that Singleton was inspired by Alfred Sloan and his book My Years with General Motors. I talked about this book quite a bit in my episodes on the early history of GM. Now, I'm a little confused by the next passage, as I disagree with the reasoning that I see in the book Distant Force. It is a great book, and the author did a really nice job. This one section really puzzles me, though. Maybe I'm missing something. Maybe that's on me. I don't want to nitpick, but I think it's very important to understand why Teledyne went in the direction that it did and how they formulated their plan. I'm going to start with the section in Distant Force. In that book, the author wrote, quote, Henry talked to me on several occasions about a book by the former chairman of General Motors Corporation. He told me that he had learned a very important concept from that book, which he wished to use in the growth of Teledyne. He explained that in about 1921 or 1922, after World War I, and during a very difficult economic time of recession, General Motors needed additional funds to finance their growth and had a plan to sell bonds to the general public. The bond sale was a complete failure, and the chairman had written in his book that it had taught him an important lesson. It was that for a corporation to grow and to have a strong financial base, it needed to have, as a part of itself, an interest in substantially financial-oriented institutions. So General Motors had started the General Motors Acceptance Corporation and invested in other financial groups. As a result of his interest in this idea, Henry had decided that at some point, when Teledyne had reached a certain size, he would seek out financial organizations we could acquire. So near the very end of our acquisition period, we did go in that direction before we finally stopped. We began acquiring a number of financial and insurance companies which was a significant change from our usual aerospace, metals, industrial, and consumer company acquisitions, end quote. This section really confuses me. General Motors did have financial issues in the early 1920s, and the author here is saying that this made GM realize it needed to own financial institutions. GMAC, which stood for General Motors Acceptance Corporation, was founded by GM in 1919. This was by far the most important financial institution that GM owned, and it was started just before this difficult event the author of Distant Force writes about. The author mentions that GM failed to secure debt financing in the early 1920s. This is true, and it was a situation that Alfred Sloan wrote about in his book on GM. Distant Force says that the bond sale was a failure, and then this is what taught Singleton an important lesson. It appears to me that the author is implying GM could have secured this debt financing if it had ownership over a bank or other financial institution, and that this is why GMAC was started. This is like saying Warren Buffett bought sees candy so that he had access to free chocolate. I don't see this type of reasoning in Sloan's book, My Years with General Motors. He talks about starting GMAC because bankers refused to make auto loans as they thought they were a bad risk. There was a gap in the market. GM figured car loans could be safe, or at least an acceptable risk, and then this would help them sell more cars. Their distribution system needed financing, in terms of both dealers as well as customers. Teledyne was buying insurance companies, not providing financing to their customers. So I don't quite see the relevance in this comparison. Entering the financial industry worked out really well for both GM and for Teledyne, but the reasoning that the author gives in Distant Force doesn't really make sense to me. Banks and insurance companies need plenty of capital to operate safely. If you are in desperate need of capital in the new and growing automobile industry, creating a separate business that is capital intensive does not sound like the solution to me. 
It just doesn't solve the problem that the author's referencing. Here's an excerpt from Alfred Sloan's book, My Years of General Motors. First, Sloan wrote about why they looked to the capital markets. Quote, Needless to say, so rapid a growth could not have been financed entirely out of earnings. The industry was still getting started, and in General Motors, it was a case of laying a base for the years of high production ahead. To acquire the assets of Chevrolet and United Motors and to purchase a 60% interest in the Fisher Body Corporation, General Motors paid with its own securities. But most of the expenditures were made in cash, and so the corporation had to go to the capital markets, end quote. I find it interesting that Sloan wrote that GM had to go to the capital markets. The company hoped to raise $85 million, but it had paid out dividends to shareholders of $58 million from 1918 to 1920. These dividends didn't need to be paid out, especially for a company that was growing so rapidly. This is sort of like a teenager asking their parents for some money after spending all of their allowance at the mall. Part of GM's borrowings were going to afford dividends. $27 million would have been much easier to raise than $85 million. Anyways, back to the topic Distant Force was discussing. I believe the next excerpt is what the author was referring to. When discussing GM's attempt at raising capital through an equity offering and later through a debt offering in 1920, Sloan wrote in his book, My Years with General Motors, quote, The new issue was a failure. It revealed the concern with which the financial community regarded General Motors' growing inability to control its internal affairs. Mr. Durant and Mr. Raskob had hoped to raise about $85 million through the new debenture issue. They were able to raise only $11 million. Hence, the DuPonts had to intervene and with their aid, General Motors sold more than $60 million worth of new common stock in the summer of 1920, and a little later borrowed over $80 million from a group of banks. Altogether, General Motors increased its capital employed by some $316 million during the expansion period from January 1, 1918 to December 31, 1920. Of this increase, $54 million came from earnings reinvested in the business, after payments of dividends totaling $58 million. The rest of the increase resulted largely from the sale of new securities for cash and the issue of new securities in payment for properties acquired, end quote. To repeat myself, GMAC was already formed before 1920, and GM decided to go that route to help sales and to ease the burden on its distribution system. GMAC wasn't really formed in order to get better access to capital or to the capital markets. I could be misinterpreting what the author tried to say in Distant Force, but I figured this was worth exploring. Before moving back to Teledyne, I will read one more quote from Sloan's book on GM discussing the formation of GMAC. Quote, We got into this business over 40 years ago when the need for financing the distribution of automobiles first arose. Mass production brought with it the need for a broad approach to consumer financing, which the banks did not then take kindly to. They neglected, I might say, they declined, to meet the need. And so some other means had to be found if the auto industry was to sell cars in large numbers. When GMAC was formed in 1919, facilities for consumer credit on a national basis did not exist. Merchants as far back as I can remember and before that, I am told, granted time payment loans for houses, furniture, sewing machines, pianos, and other articles too expensive for most people to buy for cash. And I suppose that banks must have lent to selected individuals some money that went for that purpose, end quote. Distant Force cites a few interviews in Forbes that Singleton gave, and the reasoning here for entering the insurance business makes much more sense to me. Quote, in the January 1968 issue of Forbes magazine, Henry was asked the question, why the insurance business? His answer was that the health of an organization has to be strengthened by the growth of its capital resources. We wouldn't borrow money from them, he said, but if you own the resources, that's what counts. 
we now have a net worth of $150 million. If we had $600 million, we'd be quite a different company, and we need to be if we're going to grow, end quote. Maybe this answer better explains Singleton's thinking. The health of an organization has to be strengthened by the growth of its capital resources. Insurance companies can typically retain their earnings and grow their capital base without too much harm to its return on capital. Much of the capital of an insurance company is invested in stocks or bonds, and this investment portfolio can grow right along with the growth in the capital of a company. Since Singleton was focused on growth, he wanted businesses that could keep retaining earnings and growing its capital base over time. Insurance is a business that has the potential to soak up plenty of capital as it grows. This is not always the case, but it has the potential to do so. Quote, When questioned again in an interview with Forbes magazine, January 15, 1969, as to his reasons for making these acquisitions, his answer was, Stability. Insurance appeals to us because of the stable, growing base it gives us to continue our growth. When questioned about the conservative nature of those acquisitions, his answer was, None of our insurance companies is large enough to hurt us, and since their assets don't include big portfolios of inflated common stocks, their downside risk is minimal. He continued, Insurance is a business of numbers, all carefully calculated by actuaries. There is a calculable result that you can pretty neatly forecast. They can all be counted on to go up, maybe not so fast, but up nonetheless. If a company is going to keep growing at the rate we want it to grow, it has to do some new things along the way. What we're doing now is providing the more stable base that will enable us to produce that growth four or five years from now, end quote. Singleton said that no insurance company was large enough to hurt Teledyne. This was in 1969. By 1974, this was put to the test. Argonaut, the property and casualty insurance company that Teledyne owned, reported substantial losses. The business historically focused on workers' compensation, but it expanded into medical malpractice insurance over time. In 1973, Argonaut reported insurance premiums earned of $396 million. You can think of this as the revenue. They had losses on policies for the year of $421 million, as well as another $96 million of underwriting expenses. This is not good. The firm did have some investment income from interest on its fixed income portfolio, but the pre-tax operating loss was $85 million. On top of all of this, the stock market was in the gutters during this time period. When it rains, it pours. Argonaut had to sell some of the stocks it owned in order to cover these losses. This led to a loss on sale of investments of $21 million for the year. At the end of the day, the reported net loss after tax for 1973 was $105 million. When managing the finances of a company, it is important to keep in mind that multiple issues can pop up at once. You might have an investment portfolio of savings to fall back on, but that portfolio can go down right about the time you need to rely on it. In this case, the economy is in rough shape, Teledyne's subsidiary reports bad results, all while the stock market is down. This is why companies need a nice capital cushion to fall back on, especially in the insurance business. Argonaut lost $105 million after tax for 1973. This was a major loss for the subsidiary. Argonaut entered the year with $141 million of equity capital. By the end of 1973, Argonaut had just $29 million of capital. The losses in one year just about wiped out its whole shareholder's equity. Although this was painful for Teledyne, Overall, it was fine for the parent company level. Teledyne overall reported positive net income in 1973. Its other insurance subsidiary, Unicoa, reported net income of $22 million. Its non-financial businesses were profitable as well, earning $65 million after tax. In 
Teledyne itself entered the year with $534 million of equity capital. This was a company with diversified earnings streams flowing in, as well as enough equity capital to absorb a loss like this from one of its subsidiaries. I don't think this rough year from Argonaut is what Singleton ever envisioned having to deal with, but this was proof that he was right. No individual subsidiary could seriously threaten Teledyne. In the 1974 annual report, this is what Singleton had to say about the situation at Argonaut. Quote, Argonaut's main strength and its historic source of growth and profitability has been the writing of workmen's compensation insurance. Argonaut has also provided malpractice insurance on a moderate scale to hospitals for many years. Recently, however, Argonaut greatly increased its activity in malpractice insurance by providing coverage to individual physicians and surgeons. This business has been unprofitable. Statistical studies indicate that malpractice claims frequency is growing very rapidly and that the average size of claims and related awards and settlements is growing even faster. In contrast, the rate of increase in the corresponding premiums paid for the coverage has not kept pace. Experience shows that after a year of insurance coverage ends, claims related to that year continue to be made for many years in the future. This means that reserves to pay for future claims must be provided out of current premiums. Since the expected future claims and corresponding reserves now exceed the related current premiums, the difference must be recorded as a current loss. Argonaut's reserves now appear to be adequate to cover the expected losses. Most of the company's reserves are currently held in the form of marketable securities, and a large percentage are invested in short-term commercial paper and certificates of deposit. It is expected that these reserves will be paid out gradually over a period of several years in the future. Although Argonaut's financial condition is presently sound, the company is still losing money on individual physician and surgeon malpractice policies. Argonaut intends to discontinue providing this coverage, and in order to remain solvent, Argonaut must cancel these policies or obtain adequate rates in the near future. A number of lawsuits opposing the necessary rate increases or cancellations exist, but Argonaut believes that these suits will be settled satisfactorily and that the rate of increases or cancellations will not be unduly delayed. Argonaut is continuing to provide hospital malpractice insurance, but for fewer risks at higher rates than in the past. The company's principal business will remain its workman's compensation insurance. Once the malpractice insurance losses have been ended, Argonaut should be able to return to profitability. End quote. First off, I should note that this was a difficult period for insurance companies. I already covered episodes on this podcast about Geico. It flirted with bankruptcy during this time frame. Berkshire Hathaway had some insurance subsidiaries that struggled during the 1970s as well. It was a tough period. It is important to note that growth is dangerous for financial companies. I know Teledyne was all about growth. Investors in banks and insurance companies just need to be wary of too much growth. In this case, Argonaut entered a new business line, which was medical malpractice, and got its head handed to it. Another note on this excerpt from the 1974 annual report is that Singleton mentions Argonaut's solvency is at risk. This was definitely true with only $29 million of equity capital remaining. However, there were no worries about Teledyne's solvency. Teledyne could have let this subsidiary go bankrupt without it being fatal to the parent company. Teledyne would have lost its investment in Argonaut, which would have been a tough pill to swallow but Teledyne itself would not be on the hook if liabilities spun out of control. Teledyne would have taken a reputational hit, though, if it let its subsidiary file for bankruptcy. Teledyne chose to put additional capital into Argonaut to save it, but it wasn't obligated to do so. The most painful piece of this experience for Teledyne might have been related to the timing. Just when valuations were going down in a big way 
and when the stock market was at a more attractive valuation, the company was unable to aggressively deploy capital since it was dealing with major losses coming from Argonaut. Teledyne had to make sure it had capital on hand to deal with these issues. It might have kept more dry powder on hand for safety than otherwise would have been the case. It's tough to have cash on hand during a severe crisis. If everyone had plenty of cash on hand, then it wouldn't have been a crisis in the first place. Even though it's a little long, I'm going to read an excerpt from Distant Force discussing this issue with malpractice at Argonaut. Quote, Jack Bowley was running Argonaut at the time it was acquired. He and Henry would sit in Henry's office for long periods discussing Henry's intentions in running the company's investment portfolios. He would explain to Jack how we were going to invest more heavily in equities. All insurance companies were very sensitive to the demands of the state departments of insurance that sufficient reserves were held to meet claims in the future. And Jack was worried about that. Jack and Henry became very close in that early period. At one point, Jack and several of his associates proposed to Henry that Argonaut should expand its medical malpractice insurance business from its limited coverage for hospitals, which it was already offering, to broader coverage that would include individual physicians. After many sessions about this, Henry finally said, Jack, you may do it only if you reinsure 95% of the risks on that business. Jack Bowley assured him that this would be done, and Henry allowed Argonaut to expand their malpractice business in the early 1970s. Sometime later, I met some insurance brokers at a convention who knew of Argonaut's medical malpractice insurance writings. One of them said to me, George, the reinsurance you think is in place on that business is questionable or even non-existent. Well, I immediately returned to Los Angeles and explained to Henry that a very distinguished insurance executive had told me that we didn't have any reinsurance on that business. We investigated the whole thing and, as it turned out, we would have a large loss of $104 million, reportable in the third quarter of 1974, the biggest loss in our history. We wrote off that medical malpractice business, but this was the type of insurance that has a long tail meaning that claims could be brought against those policies long after they had been terminated. We set up an office in Chicago just for handling those claims, and that office still exists today, some 30 years later. Argonaut had to increase reserves in later years, after 1974, but not as much as for that initial loss. Most of Argonaut's reserves at that time were held in the form of marketable securities, with a large percentage invested in short-term commercial paper and certificates of deposit, and were adequate to cover the expected losses. The company's financial condition was sound, but we had to prepare to pay out those reserves gradually over several years. We took steps to increase premium rates for this coverage, cancel policies, and discontinue providing this coverage, and we were able to deal successfully with a number of lawsuits opposing rate increases and cancellations. Well, Jack Bowley had misled Henry, and it resulted in Teledyne's only really big loss. In a short time, Jack Bowley was no longer with the company. We then focused our efforts on redirecting Argonaut's activities back to its principal business, workers' compensation insurance, end quote. That's tough, but unfortunately, that is the kind of story you see often if you read enough history on insurance companies. It's a tough business. How are assets allocated at these insurance companies? How does this compare with Berkshire Hathaway during this time period? This is what most interested me when going through Teledyne's annual reports. The 1968 annual report is the first one in which includes insurance. Unicoa was an unconsolidated subsidiary, which is reasonable given that Teledyne owned just over 50% of that business at this time and given that it was such a different business than Teledyne's usual operations. Interestingly, though, Teledyne continued reporting it as an unconsolidated subsidiary, even after it owned over 90% of Unicoa. This isn't really a big deal. I just found it interesting. Unicoa had total equity capital of $78 million at the end of 1968, 
it owned $36 million worth of stocks and had $37 million worth of real estate on the balance sheet. These two figures just about add up to Unicoa's equity capital. Unicoa had $160 million worth of mortgage loans, as well as $117 million worth of bonds. These two items made up the majority of the balance sheet. The way I interpret this is that Unicoa had its shareholders' funds, or equity capital, invested in real estate and stocks, while its policyholders' funds, or float, were invested in fixed income in the form of mortgage loans and bonds. Many insurance companies allocate capital this way. Unicoa had a heavy allocation of real estate, which I assume was pretty normal for the industry at this time. Even though the book Distant Force talks about how much Singleton loved real estate, this is just what Singleton inherited when he acquired the company. Maybe his love of real estate played a role in him getting excited about acquiring an insurance company with a balance sheet like this but I suspect he always planned to allocate capital differently once he was in control of the insurance company. If we jump ahead a few years, Singleton allocated more capital to stocks within his insurance companies. The equity capital of Unicoa grew by just under 5% from 1968 to 1970, while Unicoa's stock portfolio grew 69%. Stocks on the balance sheet went from $36 million at the end of 1968 to $61 million at the end of fiscal 1970. This isn't from some major gain in an investment. This is just from a reallocation of capital towards stocks. Still, I would like to point out that Unicoa's portfolio of stocks still was less than its shareholders' equity. Many investors dream of investing in insurance companies float into stocks. I've almost never seen this in practice when I study insurance companies. It's pretty rare. Unicoa had $61 million of stocks at the end of 1970, while its shareholders' equity amounted to $82 million. Float, or policyholders' liabilities, were still invested into fixed income for a number of years, even after Singleton and Teledyne got a hold of the insurance business. This changed over time, though. It might have taken Singleton some years to steer the ship in a different direction. If you jump ahead nearly a decade after Teledyne acquired its first insurance subsidiary, it eventually had some of its float invested into stocks. At the end of 1976, Unicoa had $214 million of stocks at cost. The market value was a little higher. The equity capital of Unicoa was just $135 million. So almost $80 million of stocks must have been funded with liabilities. Argonaut, Teledyne's other insurance subsidiary, had $293 million of stocks against equity capital of just $40 million. The situation at Argonaut was extremely unusual due to the issues and losses from malpractice that I mentioned earlier. Teledyne put more capital into Argonaut in 1977, which I'm sure was needed from a regulatory standpoint and from a safety standpoint. I should point out that by the mid-1980s, the float of Teledyne's insurance companies were back to being heavily invested in fixed income. Unicoa owned $461 million of stocks in 1986, while it had equity capital of $1.2 billion. This tells me that Singleton might have just been more aggressive with its capital in the 1970s due to the opportunities in the stock market at that time. Singleton and Teledyne were always opportunistic as the investment landscape changed. The balance sheet of their insurance companies looked very different in the late 1970s than it did both before and after that period. Interestingly, Berkshire Hathaway acquired its first insurance company in 1967. Teledyne took control of its first insurance subsidiary the following year in 1968. I just mentioned that Teledyne started investing its insurance float into stocks around 1976. What did Berkshire's insurance subsidiaries look like in 1976? The Berkshire Hathaway Insurance Group had equity capital of $88 million in 1976, while it had stocks carried on the balance sheet of $93 million. Its portfolio of stocks was slightly funded by float at this time. Berkshire, the parent company, had more capital. $2.5 
This is just what was inside its insurance subsidiaries. In 1976, Teledyne's Unicoa had premiums earned of $263 million compared to equity capital of $135 million on a gap basis. This means that Unicoa nearly had twice the amount of revenue compared to its capital. I like to think of this as underwriting leverage. Berkshire had premiums earned of $81 million in 1976, while its equity capital was $88 million. This is less than one times leverage, while Teledyne had close to two times leverage. Berkshire had far less underwriting leverage than Teledyne during this time period at the individual subsidiary level. If you zoom out to the parent company level, both Berkshire and Teledyne had very little underwriting leverage compared to total parent company equity capital. One more note on the Berkshire and Teledyne comparison is that insurance was a bigger part of Berkshire than it was for Teledyne. In 1976, the Berkshire Hathaway Insurance Group had equity capital of $88 million, while Berkshire overall had $115 million of capital. Insurance made up north of 75% of Berkshire's capital. Teledyne had $494 million of capital in 1976, while its unconsolidated insurance subsidiaries had $174 million of capital. This means that 35% of Teledyne's capital was invested in its insurance subsidiaries. Berkshire eventually became more diversified over time, but it basically got its start in insurance after reallocating capital away from textiles. Teledyne was established in other industries first. There was something else I noticed in these annual reports that I found pretty interesting. Singleton writes at great length in his annual reports about all of their business segments, except there's almost nothing written about insurance or financial businesses. This could be partially due to the fact that the insurance subsidiaries were unconsolidated in the financials, but Teledyne still owned over 90% of Unicoa eventually. My guess is that this relates to Singleton's background, and it also shines a light on his true interests. Take the 1969 annual report, for example. Since in 1968, the insurance business had just been purchased at Teledyne. The insurance subsidiaries are barely even mentioned, other than in the footnotes to the financial statements. This is not the case for their other business segments. The annual report has a section titled Super Alloys. This segment starts out by talking about how much thrust the first jet engines had when they were developed in the 1930s, compared with the thrust of jet engines in 1969. If you flip to the next page, the report informs the reader that in larger turbines, rotor speed of 8,000 RPM is common, while the rotor speed of smaller turbines might be 60,000 RPM. The next page has a section titled, How a Gas Turbine Engine Works, complete with pictures and a diagram in case their explanation isn't sufficient for readers. At the end, before you get to the financial statements, the report gives a history on the principle of the Doppler effect. This principle was crucial in the last eight miles of travel that helped astronauts land on the moon. Teledyne Ryan Aeronautical had been building Doppler radar since the 1950s, and the business produced a Doppler sensing equipment that helped land men on the moon. So you can learn about the moon landing in this annual report to go along with your history lesson on the Doppler radar, all while there's barely even a mention of the word insurance. Henry Singleton was a scientist and engineer at heart. There's nothing wrong with that. We could use more people like Henry Singleton in the world, but they just don't grow on trees. That's where I'm going to leave off for this annual report. In the next episode, I'm going to complete my series on Teledyne. In the meantime, I'd love to hear any questions or comments from listeners. You can reach me at jacob at mcdonough-investments.com or on Twitter at mcd underscore investments. Thanks for listening.